like to thank you all, especially Professor Mikhail Galuk for this invitation and Professor Sellers. To me it's, a, it's an honor to, to speak for you about those ideas that I have been spoken around the world. And uh, each place that I go, um, usually uh, people get a little bit astonished. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to synthesize as I, I should do. But anyway, I'll do my best here if you, if you have any any <coughs> you, can, you can tell me. Um, and I will, I will rephrase what I'm saying. Uh, at first, to understand what I'm calling um, symbolic dimension of law, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, ne it's necessary to be familiarized with uh, Brazilian output who calls uh, Marcelo Neves. Um, he, he used to be a Lumanian student, in spite of uh, disagreeing with uh, Luman in some perspectives. And uh, when I, we talk about this uh, symbolic force of rights, of law, of the Constitution, uh, we are trying to, to say in, uh, in this Marcelo Neves perspective, uh, we are trying to say that um, there is a sort of uh, legislation which is uh, created to produce no effect. And uh, the sort of legislation, you know, has uh, a sort of uh, symbolic force. And not, not only, not precisely in a, in a um, uh, linguistic sense, but in the sense that uh, the legislation is created to be ineffective. And uh, according to him, there is a sort of, uh, there are three kinds of uh, symbolic legislation. The first one is the legislation that affirms conflict, uh, conflicting social values. So the legislation is created just to, to be affirmative about the existence of a, a kind of social conflict event. There's, there's a second a kind of legislation you now that we, that's made to reinforce trust in government and another kind that is called also symbolic law, uh, which is created to postpone the solution of the social conflict. So that's what, that uh, is what you have to keep in mind when I, I, I talk about this uh, symbolic force. So then, let me try to explain what I'm going to do with it today. Um, I have a basic premise here, which is uh, that equality as a right that includes the economic treatment between men and women has been established in Brazilian legislation as well in the other democratic countries as a basis of its rule of law for years. However, and this is the, the central question, this is not what it is uh, what is at hand in the present in the present discussion, but rather about to what extent <coughs> the normative force of legislation is created to Pure mere symbolic effect to its validity and application. So, as a hypothesis, I am uh, assuming that the legislation concerning policies of gender is largely symbolic, not in a linguistic sense, but in the sense that it suffers from an integrity, it suffers from an uh, intentional lack of effectiveness, which is grounded in the whole of the legislative process. My proposal uh, is the revision of uh, this meaning of uh, the administrative function uh, for more comprehensive and actions 
founded not on the, the classical principle of the New York State, but rather on the pluralist emphasis on the colonial individualism that you have them there in South America. The later, all of the meaning of, the meaning of legal and political functions of the state it, uh, itself. Well, I have also to add here that uh, when Marcel Lenz uh, talk about this, am I being clear? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I also have to say that I have a dissent with uh, Marcel Lenz's theory, which considers the, the symbolic law, only the law, that it doesn't have any effectiveness. I have been studying this, and I, I think we, we can consider an effective. Also, the law that produced um, no, no effect in a political sense. What I want to say is that um, if we think about the, the gender policies since the universal, the, the, the declaration of universal human rights. Now we are going to see that the discrepancy, uh, there is a gap between the, the rights, the effective rights of women and the effective, effective rights of men in all those countries. What does it mean that, um, what does it mean that we, we are not better today that we, we have been before. What does it mean that we are, um, we have been improved? But definitely means that we still are in a sort of disadvantage. So in this sense, maybe we could say that there is a qualitative and effectiveness of the law. And that is uh, what I'm talking about. So I didn't come here today to, to discuss about the improvements. I'm here to, to point out something that I think uh, might be in the, in the ground of this discussion, in the sense that um, maybe the, our legislative is not uh, prepared to, to build a, a real equality or equal countries, or equal uh, rights, as we are always assuming as lawyers, as, as teachers, as professors, and uh, so This is my sense, because Marcel is very clear when the Nevis, Professor Nevis is very clear when he, he talks about the symbolic force of war. And this is not my perspective, because uh, as I said, of course we have many quantitative improvements. What we can say, on the other hand, is that the gap between the, this both universe has been improved in the same uh, velocity, in the same way. So, then I, I, I propose this question, you know, uh, what can we do to make this legislation more effective? What can we do in a scenario like this? And then I have to, to say that I have a profound disagreement about our uh, uh, law theory, you know, the, the sort of uh, law theory that we are supporting at the moment. I think, um, as I'm, um, I'm, um, I'm going to, I think that this is maybe one of the reasons that this uh, legislation you now is not uh, so effective if we see all this from a, a legal point of view. However, um, let's start um, considering the, the basic things. Um, if we consider the Brazilian legislation you now, we then see that all, all the Brazilian constitutions since 1934, uh, as well as the Charter of the, of the United Nations of the 1945, 
you know, red, uh, red tiles by the Brazilian uh, Congress. Uh, all of them, they, they have the idea of equality as something that uh, even uh, men and women of this equality gender, gender as something that ground our, our rule of law. And, uh, and then we can see this on our, on our under legislation, on our uh, administrative legislation, and uh, as the labor legislation, as the uh, electoral poll, which is uh, from 1932. And uh, so this means that it's not because a lack of legislation, so it's not uh, because of a uh, we don't have legislation that the situation uh, persists. Uh, the truth is, um, on the other hand, that in spite of all this sixth year of uh, legislation considering the necessity of um, a sort of uh, equality, between, uh, equality between those genders, you know, the, the, the gap insists to remain. Like here in the US, like here in the US, Brazil also has this the same problem of uh, uh, the amount of um, payments that we are able to to redistribute the women. We are still concerned to a sort of uh, group of words, you know, <laughs> so of our jobs that we call the, the female words and uh, for us it uh, might be maybe a paradox considering that we are in the academy and, uh, and most of the time we have um, more women is studying uh, each day law and, uh, and at the university but the truth is in the, the market that's not able to, to receive us in the same uh, in the same way you know, in the, with the same sort of uh, equality. So this data uh, can show uh, <coughs> a little bit better, you know, that uh, the gap remains. And I also have a test about it, so if you are interested in this, I have a, an article to develop it a little bit better concerning about the uh, data and so on. So, the hypothesis, as I said before, is to, to, answer, no, to, answer, to answer such question, I begin from the, the hypothesis that the legislature is considering, considering policies of gender is larger or small. Hence, it, its effectiveness depends largely on the amplification of affirmative actions within the form of the political juridical functions of this state. A change that can only become real a reality under a new conception of pluralism and political participation. What will require a sort of uh, resignification of Montesquieu's theory, for instance. And uh, as a theoretical basis, I, I will take a theory that uh, as I said, has gained a huge threat of the reign of Brazil. This next theory of symbolic constitution and the symbolic force of rights to, to its most capillary consequence regarding the effectiveness of the rights of the, of the women after 60 years of validity in the international and the civil scenario. My shift on the feminist theory, theory, I believe, to reveal a new theoretical and empirical landscape regarding gender equality. According to Nevis, the symbolic force of law is contained in certain um, contained in the statute, statute, statute by the legislative, legislative power, which are impacted with the finality of the law effect, effect. Whatever. Whatever. And then the proposal. By again, with the most of the of the of the proposal, the, uh, proposal theory, I will set out to prove 
that the most efficient way to deactivate the strong social and political demands is to give away to them, to them in the law and then deactivating them in the invisibility of the administrative regulations <coughs> that turn, I think that in me itself requires. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, a way of demobilize social movements, you know, that we should, uh, usually are engaged to this pers gender perspective is uh, not, it's to regulate the, the right in this, in, this per in this perspective. So if you become the, the, the social demand a lot, <coughs> usually the, the, social, the social movements get relief and then they stop and they stop fighting because uh, it seems they, they have achieved their goal. But the truth is the bureaucracy that we have inside the administrative inside the administrative uh, public administration, you know, uh, it prevents us to to prevent them to, to have the right that is, that is uh, somehow um, Established in law. So, if you don't uh, reveal this uh, administrative perspective, in order, for instance, to approach the governmental <coughs> perspective of uh, executive power to the administrative function of the same uh, executive power, uh, we uh, we we are um, somehow. Uh, hiding behind this bureaucracy, all the the political force of all those movements. Am I being clear? Okay. So uh, to attend this, to attend the uh, formation, I will also bring to the to the floor some uh, some of this work. Uh, here I'm talking about going to the centre. Social scientists uh, work on the reformation of the modern state through the assumption of the transcendental pluralism, as well the, the Bolivian and the Equatorian, Equatorian experience of legal and political pluralism. This is just a framework, it's just a way of uh, showing that we have new ideas around in South America that to propose a reverse on this, on this uh, rule of law, traditional perspective, which, uh, which has, not, has not been tested uh, by now, but um, has, I think, and which has the, the benefit of trying to open a little bit, uh, a little bit more, the, the, a room to, to gender and also to equality uh, or an equality discussion, discussion. So for them, I propose uh, first the need to undertake a deep revision of the role of the executive power in the articulation and, and execution of public policy. Second, the need to adopt affirmative actions direct at the political participation of the women in political and administrative policies in the, in the whole of the state of the Special legislative as a visible uh, alternative to the, for this, uh, for this compression of the quality, uh, uh, which, was, which is my main concern. Um, put in a nutshell, and uh, without the presentation of uh, offering a correct or final answer to, to the problem of uh, inequality of gender, I will develop the, the whole of the, the test target, target line, target line, the question of how much time of social school is necessary to recognize the mere symbolic nature of laws that regulate gender policies which are the human inclusive. Policies of gender have not been effective in the sense in the sense 
that they, they do not promote the emancipation, liberation of the women based on the real reference of the plural feminine, feminine condition. Henceforth, I will propose a revision of the, of the meaning of the administrative function purporting for, for more comprehensive affirmative actions. Founded not on the base of, in the classical principles of the, the liberal state, but rather on the pluralist emphasis of the, the colonial legal movements. The letter offers the, the meaning of legal and political functions of the, of the state themselves. Well, I to 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 do this, and it's a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, complicated to to explain uh, in a deeper way. I um, I I try to propose a, a sort of new perspective of uh, plurinationalism in the in the Latin American new constitutions, which uh, in order to to answer this urgent question posed at the top and will introduce to Cal, no, this uh, which will be we will need to develop further. The first path enters uh, the idea that the classical administrative function is not merely a neutral and not just a technique of government. Rather well administrative function is a sharp political function. And as such it is a kind of invisible space where loss effectiveness is strained and turned symbolic. Uh, insofar, administrative function must also be a focus of a political and human rights theory as an active, active space that constructs or debunks new rights. This uh, the second the second perspective path uh, or the second path is in, is fired in the constitution of uh, the <coughs> uh, South American countries. You know what does it mean to to keep the same form of governance? I'm not trying to say that we all have to be how can I say plural in this sense, but maybe we can be inspired by some changes they are trying that they are trying to <coughs> propose in order to to build our own path in our own reality or in our in our uh, rule of law perspective. And uh, where the plural plural national state appears as an, a novel political and legal model that fractures traditional constitutional law. One of the, uh, of the crucial features, features of the plurinational uh, state is an ambi uh, ambiguous transformation of the women's, uh, women's role within the state, which includes an aggressive, aggressive policy of inclusion via feminine quotas in uh, all of the, of the state's powers. The letter trickles down immediately as a as a way to to, to implement in a manner that it's uh, in a manner that is effective. The goal of the legislation designed to to reach gender equality and the autonomy of the of the women. And um, to give you uh, an example, what I'm talking about, um, considering this classical separation of uh, executive power function, I I consider that the, this classical separation, you know, that the uh, jurisprudence fashions between a political function, governmental one, and an <coughs> administrative function within the executive power is a problematic differentiation that must, most of time serves as the perfect, the perfect vehicle to render law symbolic. Because, because um, uh, we, in this um, administrative law, usually we don't, we don't consider 
the, the planning, you know, the, the act of planning thing as something that is connected with law. So we have, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be clear, but we have the planes. And uh, in a political perspective, when we are talking about public policy perspective, the plane is something that must be there. Because without it, we, we, we are not be able to, to afford efficiency. But when we talk about the administrative procedures and how law deals, deals with these administrative procedures, the, the sense of the efficiency is not connected anymore with planning or with the, the, the act of playing goals to the public administration. So we used to, to separate, you know, this governmental uh, perspective from the, uh, from the administrative perspective which turns everything on bureaucracy, which turns everything on a sort of schizophrenic way of dates, uh, rights and, uh, and, um, and law. Because usually the one who is in charge of claiming public policies, it's not the one who is in charge of execute this public policy. So if you don't reframe this somehow, if you don't uh, try to establish a sort of um, integration between those two functions um, of executive power, you know, in a way that we are able to to present results and, uh, and in a way that we can uh, establish meanings to administrative law. We are, what we are having, we, what we will do is a sort of, um, how can I say, uh, reinforce, reinforces of this symbolic perspective. Well, uh, then I, I, I try to be a little bit more, more um, specific about this uh, classical separation, you know, between the, the powers and the, the idea of a check and balance, but um, I, I'm afraid I will not have time to, to explain this in a, in a proper way, so I just uh, leave the idea, you know, as a, something that we can talk about later. And um, I'm not considering this, and, uh, and then, and then and considering also the, the necessity of uh, take this participatory uh, movement, social movement of the work that those participatory social movements uh, have been produced, you know, uh, maybe we should uh, try to establish a new, a new openness of the, the system you know, based on diversification and um, so based on the idea that the, the system does turn upside down and uh, a new frame for this constitutional equity to be developed. Well, I, I could be here, I could be here trying to to develop this in a more uh, profound way. If you are interested, I can leave those, those, uh, those slides and also the, the past. But um, to conclude, but I think it's uh, in, a, in a synthesis, what I think is that we have been uh, trying to, to, how can I say, to afford equality using uh, some old tools that uh, are not able to, to produce this anymore. So which are these old tools? This, this classical constitutional theory, the, the idea that we need um, a sort of a very clear separation of functions in the executive power, the idea of procedures that uh, prevent people 
to, to bring to public administration, administration their, their demands in a more effective way, you know, in a more easy way. And uh, to do this, uh, we need to somehow to start to rethink the, the basis of this uh, idea of a liberal rule of law and uh, maybe try to consider this idea of pure nationalities, uh, pure, pure nationalities that we, we are starting to, to ground in South America and uh, somehow has been distorted by media in a very, in a very strong way. I don't know if here to, to discuss you, with you anything that you are interested on. I hope I, I, I have been clear, you know, and uh, I hope you have understand. I know it, uh, I have many ideas that I just throw on the wind, you know, uh, without a, a deep, a deep uh, perspective. But that's just because of uh, the time and uh, the problem that I have here with, uh, with the language. It's also a barrier to for itself. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Arruda, for those very interesting and very clear remarks. And we have um, now an opportunity for questions and conversation. So I feel the floor open. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, one question I have for you is, you know, in the United States, we have an African American president, and so some people read that to mean that we don't need to take affirmative steps towards more political equality. We've solved our race problem. Okay? In Brazil, you have a woman president. So how does that impact gender <coughs> equality and what the public think about gender equality in Brazil? Uh, not too much, also. Uh, um, well, from my perspective, you know, what I think is when I talk about this, uh, this idea of uh, affirmative action, I'm, talk I'm thinking something more, how can I say, universal. Those two examples are very particular. You understand? Mm -hmm. So, um, Okay, and we used to say, okay, it's okay, because now here we have uh, an African American president, so the, the racist, it's, uh, it's uh, so, you know, yeah. down there we have uh, a woman as a, as a president, so, okay, the, the, the gender thing, you know, it's partially so. Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, we are not being succeed with this, all those rules about equality. So we need to try new perspectives. And uh, a new perspective would be to <coughs> establish a number of uh, political places or administrative places, you know, for, uh, for women. In fact, we have this in our, le in our electoral law, which, uh, which says that uh, each party has a, must have a number of places to reserve to women. But the problem is... For the candidacy. Huh? For the candidacy. Yeah, yeah, for the candidacy. But the problem is precisely this, you yeah. know, uh, for the candidacy. We, we don't have any guarantee that uh, the, the legislative will be uh, placed... Women will get elected. Yeah. yeah. So, so on the ballot, yeah. but no one yeah. elects them. Yeah. yeah. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what I'm talking about, is, let's establish this at first, because uh, if maybe if you say, if you say, okay, half percent, half, fifty percent, you know, of uh, this public, public, um, how can you say this, this public places, you know, in the administrative, judiciary, and also in legislative, must be preservative when maybe we can, um, we <coughs> start a dialogue because at the moment we it seems to me that everything is a sort of a simulacrum. You understand? And uh, that's uh, what I'm talking about. But before this, I'm not saying that this is the solution because I see in administrative law 
um, a huge, huge problem. And uh, we say that we are not, we are not bureaucrats anymore, you know, that we are worried about development and so on and so on. But that's not true. We have a very, a very conservative, uh, administrative law, you know. That is not a matter a problem of Brazil. You can see this here in the, in the US and in Europe and so on. So I don't know if I answered you, but I think it's um, we're not going to solve the problem, but um, I think it's a little bit of a, it's a simplification to say that now everything is solved. You understand? I think that there is a case uh, very interesting is that since her inauguration, inauguration <coughs> you see uh, in Portuguese, unlike uh, English, we stress the gender in almost every noun and uh, even adjectives in French. Mm -hmm. And uh, we say uh, you, you have only governor, but we have governador for a man and governador for a woman. And the Constitution uh, says the Presidente. But since her inauguration, uh, he tried to be addressed as Presidenta. And it was a big case in, in the news. People are disagreeing with her that she can't be a Presidenta. And it, it's very symptomatic. Yeah, the resistance is yeah. uh, huge. And she has uh, to be a man to, yeah. <laughs> to rule the country, so... Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's why I'm saying that maybe we should, if, we're, if we are concerned somehow about it, not only in a gender perspective, because I think that uh, we can discuss this in a more uh, universal perspective, you know. We, we should consider the necessity of um, resignifying some theories that have been uh, around our law theory for centuries. And uh, of course, uh, when I'm saying that, I'm not uh, saying that these, those theories are not, has not been important to our own identity as area and so on. But what I'm trying to say is that um, if we look in a close, closer perspective, you know, we will see that what uh, Congress is able to do, somehow law is able to undo. You know, with all this bureaucracy, all this, uh, how can I say, all these concepts that somehow are not so so easy to everybody to understand. So if we are concerned about this in a, in a minimal way, maybe we should try to, to consider something. Professor Bassler. Yeah, that was very interesting, actually, what you said about the language issue. Um, I know we had um, a lot of the state legislatures several years ago actually tried to um, scrub the, the entire code to see if there's references to he or men and, and make them neutral in, in a way so that they could at least, the law at least would reflect the neutrality of, of or gender neutral nature. Um, and I think in, in, in some languages, right, there's the feminine, masculine, yeah. um, Articles that go along with every every word in the word name should be different. Uh, so um, here it's cutting the other way because we're getting rid of the feminine forms. Women just want to use the Yeah, so you might see firemen change to firefighter, for example, or people use. I mean, those words remain in the language, but there but there's a there's a conscious effort maybe to change the the way that the language is used. Actually, um, I have a, a a South African law professor who has something he calls the struggle theory of human rights, which is sort of interesting that you you don't really. The law itself is, is there, but you have to struggle <coughs> to affect change. And Christoph uh, Haynes had written a, a piece called The Struggle Theory of Human Rights. Um, I was also curious to see what your your uh, view is, if you've been following in Germany, where they have now said that they're going to have a certain number of women for, for corporate boards, uh, for corporations to, um, uh, to have a certain, um, in, in fact, a quota. Uh, what, what, what would you be your perspective on that in terms of outside the the government structure you're looking at, the, the, the private sector, actually, which is just curious to see what you're talking about. I think, I, I, um, as I said before, I think we have a, we need to try uh, different perspectives. And uh, 
try different perspectives and in a certain way means to to lose some um, some liberal rights. You understand? And uh, in the sense that um, it's not possible to put everybody together in a sort of balance if we insist on keeping some rights that uh, somehow has been um, uh, the ground for a sort of uh, equality or inequality to be more precise. So what I think is um, if we consider this in a private perspective, it would be the hell and the right, the right, question, the right answer would be, should be, you know, uh, the state shouldn't uh, interfere too much in uh, private policies or in the private uh, sector. sector. You understand? Mm -hmm. But I, to be sincere, I, I, have, I have been considering the, the fact that maybe, the, it, maybe, maybe it should, because uh, there is another fallacy that we insist to support, which is the idea that uh, there is a real freedom, and this freedom is guaranteed by, uh, by, by law, you understand? I think that everything in a philosophical perspective is related. Relative. So, in this sense, you know, I think we are more controlled by a state that we would like to admit. And it's a sort of, how can I say, um, a strategic way of uh, turns on out the question, um, putting the, this discussion in a the, in the sort of battle between private liberties or public liberties, you understand? Mm -hmm. What I see is that there, uh, there is a huge amount of persons that uh, we, who are uh, completely invisible to, to the society. And uh, that includes sometimes the, the gender perspective. And uh, so I'm open to, I'm open to try new uh, possibilities, because I am assuming that, um, as a new, I wouldn't have problem with this sort of uh, invasive policies. But of course, this should be uh, grounded in a sort of uh, participatory, you know, um, perspective. It couldn't be a decision of uh, a government, a government, you know, inside a room. It should be something a little bit more. Discuss it, you know. The the idea of uh, uh, sustainable and uh, sustainable development somehow it's leading us to this direction. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So I think I think this, and I think it's very. But most of all, I think it's very tough for us to to assume that um, we live in this sort of uh, similar which encrypted, which is in, uh, is a result of uh, law encryption. Do you understand? And, uh, but as I said before, if we have uh, freedom of speech, I mean, if we can say things that we think, uh, things that we think as we think, you know, I would say that I have been, my experience in, experience in, in, um, in a, uh, as a president of an NGO, as a professor, as a lawyer, you know, and most of all, as a great observer of a human being perspective, you know, shows to me that uh, things are not running good. You understand? And that's it. this is logical. It's a matter of data. I think I'll ask a question myself. Mm -hmm. um, it's always interesting, I think, to see uh, where we agree and then try and find somewhere we disagree. So I'm going to go through a series of agreements and try and identify some disagreement. Um, as I, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that much of law is purely expressive of certain aspirations or values rather than actually securing them. Truth. Right? Everyone would agree with that. You say that law is often not very effective or not very effective in securing the ends that are declared by the norm. And that's also true. Very often the law is not effective. 
you point out that sociocultural transformation is very difficult to achieve and not solely dependent on love. That's also true. So, so where I begin to get nervous is your analysis of the rule of law and your attitude towards executive power. And you said, I think, that the rule of law or getting, uh, securing uh, legal norms uh, that promote equality is actually counterproductive because it gives the illusion of success in that you have the legal norm. But the equality or the right that's meant to be protected is not in fact secure because the administration of the law is faulty. And I think that again is something that we all observe all the time. To get the law is not sufficient. You also have to get uh, uh, effective administration of the law. And very often in our country, you know, the government in power may actually not wish a law to be well administered, <laughs> and then that happens on purpose. So it's, that analysis is not wrong. But I, what I find very troubling is to then draw the conclusion that the rule of law is somehow less than desirable. Because what you see when you have administrative failure is a failure of the rule of law. It's not uh, that the rule of law is a bad thing, it's that the administrators are subverting the rule of law. And I think that's what we should be fighting against. So I think your solutions, you had a number of, yeah, we, we sort of ran out of time, I think, when you started to talk about the solutions. But there were three solutions, and I thought that they were different. So quotas for women, paritary rights. That's totally unproblematic. You can do that through the rule of law. Uh, many countries have done it. In fact, when we finish, I'll give you a book that we wrote about it. You know, they have this in many places. Our US Senate would be ideal for that. Every state has to be have one man, one woman. That would be easy to do. Um, administrative sabotage, yeah, that's, we see that all the time. And we should somehow attack our administrators or, or maybe control them in such a way that they have to work. But that is maybe an argument for more checks and balances, not for less checks and balances, but we have to control the administrators. So where you actually got, I thought, to making your own proposal is where I got the most scared, which is when you started to talk about the executive power. And if I understood you correctly, you were saying, look, let's take less, let's, let's not control the executive power. Let's, let's leave the executive power. You gave the example of Bolivia and Ecuador where the executive power has dispensed with uh, rule of law and dispensed with checks and balances, and they rule directly for maybe good purposes, trying to achieve good things, but nevertheless without, without control. And to me, that's extremely dangerous. Hey, can I, can I yeah. know? Yes, of course. Well, I finished, actually. You can answer. <laughs> so that's the part I'm worried about. No, because it's so much information yeah. <laughs> to me to, to organize the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, first, I have to to say that I'm not saying okay. Let's uh, let's put the uh, rule of law down. You know, let's forget about it. I'm not an um, You understand? I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, proposing this perspective. With all the respect, what I'm saying that this this idealistic perspective of uh, rule of law that we have been supporting for years, you know, can be. Uh, excellent for a group of people, for some groups, you know, and uh, independent on in which part of this society you are, we could say, okay, it's not only too bad, it's uh, most of all, it's excellent. Uh, from my perspective, for instance, in the Brazilian society, I shouldn't be here complaining about the the rule of law, you know, because I uh, this rule of law made made possible to me to be here, you know, to be a citizen of a, of a world, uh, if I can say uh, if I can say this. But I mean, I am complaining. Why am, am I complaining? Or at least, am, why am I trying? Am I trying to um, to have a better proposal of this rule of law? Because I see that this rule of law doesn't work for everybody, works only for a sort of people, you know, a sort of uh, uh, group of persons, which is divided in many, many perspectives, you know, sometimes it's the, the color of the skin, sometimes it's the gender, but sometimes, sometimes it's only the fact that you are poor, you are poor, and then you are, you are out, you understand, you don't count. And in this sense, I'm sort of the virus. Uh, in the sense, I'm a sort, in a sort of, I'm a sort of a, a, a divergent, divergent. 
and I uh, so first I'm not saying that it's uh, we have to forget about it. Definitely we need something to control us. And definitely putting in a very open way, you know, we need control. But the truth is, the control that we have been able to produce, it's being a, a sort of very uh, ex excluded control. So maybe we should, uh, should be a little bit more concerned about it. And one of the, when I say that I have to, to make a correction here, you know, we can't say, I don't agree that we could say, and I forgot to say that I'm, uh, I don't have any uh, political perspective or ideological perspective that I would like to support here. You know, I have my own conditions, but uh, this is not the, the ground of my speech. You know, uh, before everything, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who is concerned about this uh, humankind perspective of life. But, uh, that we seems that seems that we have forget about it. So I don't think we could say that uh, the, what is happening in Ecuador or what's, what's happening in Bolivia now, it's um, completely how can I say a completely uh, a race a race of uh, executive power. You know, we 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 will need more time to discuss this in a in a legal perspective. What I see down there, it's a group of people, you know, trying to, to make their voice count somehow. And a, a sort of, a, a sort of a, uh, how can I say, governance, trying to deal with, to deal with this in a way that they are, they are not used to. So, just to, to give an example, you know, in Ecuador, uh, almost 90% of the population is indigenous population, you know, and they are completely excluded of everything. So one of the innovative perspectives <coughs> that they are building down there, it's uh, the possibility of having a, a judicial system only for this indigenous, indigenous that has been judged by, you know, uh, white people. Understand where they are all life, and down there, the prejudice is something that's not disguised. It's something that you can see, and um, as everywhere, you know. Uh, today, I think that prejudice is unless disguised that, uh, that than ever. So, in this pers this perspective, I would say I would make this. Um, how can I say? I would add this. You know. What I'm really worried about, and I'm, what I'm really concerned about when I talk about executive power is the fact that if you are government, you know, you usually don't have, don't need to have any, any perspective of reality to govern. You understand? In the sense that um, you can, you can, uh, you can build law based it based only on politi politicians, political stance. So, and so <coughs> how we are, we are helping them with this perspective, which is not good for the system, and how we are helping them with this. Uh, when we study administrative law, there is nowhere in you group saying that uh, claiming, claiming is is a re it's a real administrative function. You understand? Planning, it's not considered, it's considered in a general sense, but it's not something that law has to be worried about. We don't need to understand, to teach, for instance, um, administrative law. You don't need to understand about planning and how the things, and planning is the basis of any public policies. So uh, the truth is, that uh, we need, we, we detach the administrative law, you know, and we study um, concurrence and, and uh, me means to, to, to prevent corruption and uh, the ways that we can uh, expel uh, goods from people, you understand, but this is not connected with uh, uh, something very simple, which is planning. 
So when I, I present Montesquieu idea, you know, and I, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we need a check and balance. But this, um, this uh, sort of apartheid that we see in some rule of law perspective, with, which divide what is a governmental action from what is considered administrative action, you know, has to be reframed somehow. Because the result is that who applies, who is in charge of the flying law, usually doesn't have an idea, doesn't have an idea about how and why the law was built like this, you understand? And vice versa. Who usually uh, build the law, you know, or has the initiative of the, of, of the law, of the bill, and, and so on, usually doesn't have an, any idea about why this law needs to be built, you know, who is going to be the, the beneficiary, how, or which will be the difficulties to imp implement the, this law. And this is because we're considering this, this uh, function division, you understand? And law, and the consequence is, law is not in charge of anything which is considered political, unless you're talking about electoral law, unless you're talking about uh, constitutional law in a very specific way. So I think we, to be sincere, I think we should have to start reframing the way that we teach administrative law. And this would be a huge contribution to, to this equality issue. That's what I think. Well, thank you. I think this has been a very uh, interesting and very productive uh, conversation. And um, I know you're willing to talk privately with anyone who has questions afterwards for a little bit. And then we're going to have an interview by University of Baltimore students. So thank you very much for your thank remarks. You.